Yo, what is up? Okay, coming at you with our next biology lecture. This is looking at inheritance, patterns of inheritance and heritability. Okay, so looking at differentiation as far as inheriting for animals and plants. All right, this is going to go over differentiation between animals and plants together. So for patterns of inheritance, again, we have our reproduction that takes place. If we are doing this based on asexual reproduction, we will have identical daughter cells. If we are sexually reproducing, there will be non-identical daughter cells. We know that our genetic material is coming from chromosomes. Those chromosomes are going to contain two sister chromatids that have a set of alleles on them that are going to make up a gene that is going to be expressed in whatever cell or whatever organism is going to have it. So each of these replicated chromosomes is going to consist of two sister chromatids, right? As far as a human, we have 23. That means we have 23 chromosomes, which means we have 46 individual chromatids. Looking at genetic differentiation and heritability, right? First, we have to look at the original science of it, or the original experiments that are showing it. And one of the first was Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was able to study pea plants. and He looked at genetic differentiation in pea plants following the basic principles of inheritance. So during this experimentation with the pea plants, he was able to see a couple of different things that happened as far as the dominant and recessive allele traits. He was able to see the patterns of inheritance of many pea plant characteristics, right? The ones that were most prominent were considered to be dominant. The ones that were less prominent were considered to be recessive, right? A dominant one is going to be something like this, where we have a green color. A recessive is going to be something like this, where we have a yellow color of a pot. So in order to breed those peas, he would take pollen from a tall plant and transfer it to a shorter plant, right? Then we would see whatever offspring would come. The seeds from the offspring would be planted. Each seed would develop into either a tall or short plant, right? That shows that the differentiation between the two is going to be selected for. So the tall gene is going to be one of them. The short gene is going to be the other. Usually the tall gene would end up being the dominant trait. The shorter gene would end up being the recessive trait. Mendel carefully pollinated and uh, controlled the transfer of pollen between the pea plants and collected the resulting seeds. So he saw what those seeds ended up becoming after he grew them in the next generation. So here's true breeding versus hybrid. So here we have a true breeding plant, which means that we have self-fertilization. Right? Self-fertilization is going to yield offspring with the same seed color as the parent, as far as this developmental pattern is confirmed. For a hybrid, this is going to be self-fertilization, which is going to yield a mix of seed colors. So we're going to have a hybridization here, right? True breeding is going to be self-fertilization where we either have offspring that has all dominant trait green pods or all recessive trait yellow pods. If it is a hybrid, that means that the self-fertilization is going to yield a mix of colors. So yellow being dominant here, all right? When we crossed a plant derived from a green seed with a plant grown from a yellow seed, what Mendel saw was that the offspring could all be yellow or they could have a mix of green and yellow. What this means is that the yellow was the dominant trait because there was never a all green offspring, which means that there was a recessive nature of that green characteristic. So if the green characteristic was recessive, that means that it would always be combined with another gene that would end up being dominant, right? So we could see some yellow, some green, or all yellow. All right. So how can we relate some of this to our own lives? Well, for instance, here we have the example of phenylketone urex or phenylketone urea. What happens here is the genetic deficiency for people in their ability to uh, metabolize phenylalanine, right? 
The metabolizing of phenylalanine is going to have to happen, especially with diet sodas, because phenylalanine is present to a large degree in these drinks. So when ingesting this, if we don't have phenylalanine enzymes in order to break that down, it can build up and become toxic. So foods containing aspartame, which is an artificial sweetener, is going to contain this warning label, right? It says contains phenylalanine. So aspartame is going to be made up partly of phenylalanine. Most people have the enzyme converting phenylalanine into tyrosine. However, if we have a genetic deficiency, there's a mutated allele in the gene encoding for the enzyme. So that means that we produce a non-functional enzyme. People who have just one copy of the recessive allele are healthy. But if we have enough of the normal protein, thanks to the dominant allele, the person is healthy. So the recessive allele seems to vanish. However, if we have two copies of the recessive allele, there is no dominant trait, then we will end up with the metabolic disorder of phenylketonuria. We cannot produce a normal enzyme, so phenylalanine will accumulate to toxic levels, causing things like intellectual disability and other problems. So genotypes and phenotypes. A genotype is going to be what the actual genes are. The phenotype is going to be what it looks like. So genotype is what the code is. Phenotype is what the actual appearance is. P's genotype is going to be for the seed color, which is the phenotype. So it consists of two alleles that are going to be inherited from the parents, and the phenotype is the outward appearance, whether it be yellow or green. If we have a homozygous dominant, we have a yellow. If we have a heterozygous dominant, we have a yellow. If we have a homozygous recessive, we have a green. So the recessive allele is going to be clouded unless it is in a uh, gene pool that has two recessive alleles paired together. And then that recessive trait will predominate and we will see the green phenotype come forward. So we kept tallies of this as far as Mendel is concerned. Kept careful tallies of the offspring from countless crosses, right? He looked at these generational differences the purebred generation, which is known as the P generation, is the first set of individuals that are mated together. The F1 generation is the first filial generation. And that is the first generation of offspring from the P generation. F2 is the next, and so on and so forth. So if you consider the grandparents are the P generation, the parents are going to be the F1 generation, and you and your siblings are the F2 generation. If you want to think about this in relation to your own development or your own bodies. So the P generation, we're gonna see two parents put together, true breeding parents, right? A dominant and a recessive. So that means that the F1 offspring is going to end up being heterozygous. We're going to have a dominant and a recessive allele paired together. If we cross between two F1 plants, meaning that we cross between two heterozygous plants to form a F2 generation, then we will end up with a fourth and a half, meaning that we'll have a fourth dominant, a fourth recessive, and then a half heterozygous. So a fourth of the offspring are going to end up being a pure dominant, fourth of the offspring will be a pure recessive, and half of the offspring will end up being heterozygous, where we have a combination of a dominant and recessive allele. So our chromosomes and genes, a chromosome, is a continuous molecule of DNA plus the associated proteins. A gene is a sequence of DNA that encodes a protein. A locus is the actual location on the gene, or sorry, on the chromosome that the gene exists. An allele is one of the two or more variants of a gene. Dominant and recessive. A dominant allele is one that's going to be expressed if it's present in the genotype. So if the dominant allele is there, that means it is the one that is expressed. If the dominant allele is absent, and only then can the recessive allele be expressed. So the recessive allele is the allele whose expression is masked at all times by the dominant allele. Genotype versus phenotype. Genotypes are going to be the individual's individual allele combination, the unique combination of genes on a particular person. Homozygous is where we possess all identical alleles. Heterozygous is possessing different alleles. So for example, the dominant and recessive of the same gene. Phenotype is the observable physical characteristics, the appearance of whatever that gene codes for. A hybrid is going to be a heterozygous, 
So this is where we have both dominant and recessive traits that are predominating. Self-fertilization can produce offspring with mixed genotypes and phenotypes. A wild type is going to be whatever the species most common allele expression is, right? So if we look at a, a population of flowers and 90% um, of them are white, that means that the wild type allele is going to end up being the white one. So the most common allele genotype or phenotype in that population would be the wild type allele. A mutant is an allele that changed, all right? So it's resulting from a mutation in a gene. Generations, according to Mendel's P, uh, plan experiments, we have a true breeding generation, which is a homozygous parent, either pure dominant or pure recessive. The F1 generation is the offspring of the pure generation, and the F2 is the offspring of the F1 generation. So looking at genetic heritability, we also employ what we call a Punnett square. So piggybacking off of Mendel's experiments with the pea plants, we have the Punnett square that, square that comes into play. This is going to show you the potential offspring that are going to be there as far as their genetic differences. So for example here, we depict the monohybrid cross of two heterozygous plants. That means we have a heterozygous female and a heterozygous male plant here. So we have a dominant versus a recessive trait. The dominant trait is going to be yellow. The recessive plate is, trait is going to be green, okay? So here we see our four different genetic codes. We have a dominant and a recessive allele on each side. So that means potential offspring could be pure dominant, pure recessive, or heterozygous. There's going to be a 50% chance that they are heterozygous, 25% chance that they are dominant, 25% chance that they are recessive. So the genotypic ratio is going to end up being one to two to one. The phenotypic ratio is going to end up being three to one because we know that if we have a dominant trait there, it will show up. So that means three out of the four potentially will have a phenotypic yellow trait production. So what if we put a dominant pure versus a heterozygous together? Well, then we're going to end up seeing that the uh, heterozygous um, is going to be masked, especially with the um, with the recessive trait. So if we put the dominant together with the recessive together, then we will end up with three fourths of them being heterozygous or pretty much 100% chance of there being yellow seeds only because there's only one recessive and that recessive allele is on a heterozygous host. So there's no way that we can combine the two to form two, uh, two recessive allele because there isn't a second recessive trait there that we can potentially have. So if we cross something like this, where we test cross the plants of heterozygous and homozygous recessive nature. Here we have the chance to come out with our recessive trait. So here we end up with two heterozygous and two homozygous recessive offsprings, which means now we have a 50% chance of a green seed versus a 50% chance of a yellow seed. All right, now we go to Mendel's law of segregation. So during our meiosis cycle, which we covered in a previous lecture, we see four chromatids that end up uh, getting expressed within all the gametes. So the four chromatids are segregated from each other and packaged into separate cells. At fertilization, our gametes are going to combine at random to form the next gener uh, generation. So this is known as Mendel's law of segregation, where gametes combine randomly in order to produce the offspring or the F1 generation. All right, so we look at generation uh, heritability in terms of disease. Uh, one of the major things that we look for here are things like disease occurrences that could potentially happen. So for instance, in the case of cystic fibrosis, here we're looking at uh, genomic deficiency as far as um, carrier proteins are concerned. So the mother is a healthy carrier is going to be heterozygous. 
that means that we're going to have uh, a dominant allele versus a recessive allele, and the dominant one is, is going to take over. So the mother is a healthy uh, individual. The father, we have a healthy carrier as well, meaning that we have a heterozygous. So in this case, we're going to see the genetic one to two to one ratio where we have a completely healthy dominant non-carrier offspring. We have two healthy carrier offsprings and we have one that would have, would, they would have the disease. So that one that does, does have the disease is going to get two recessive traits here. And that's a 25% chance. So looking at heritability and tracking inheritance, again, the Punnett square is going to be that diagram where we see how the individual alleles and the parents' gametes might combine. A monohybrid cross is a mating between two individuals that are both heterozygous. A dihybrid cross is mating between two individuals that are both heterozygous for two genes. And a test cross is going to be mating between individuals of unknown genotype and a homozygous recessive individual. So here's looking at a cross uh, producing an F1 generation. This is a dihybrid cross. So in the parental generation, one parent is homozygous recessive for two genes. The other is homozygous dominant. The F1 generation is going to be heterozygous for both genes. So if we're looking at a dihybrid cross, this is where we put two plants together to form the F1 generation and phenotypes are going to occur in a distinctive ratio in the resulting F2. So for instance here, we see female gametes put together with male gametes. We're going to have a heterozygous trait as far as the R and Y are concerned. If we put that together, then we will end up seeing some uh, variability as far as the differentiation. here. So the dominant trait is going to end up being the yellow coloration and the rounded seed. Right? And we're going to see that for the most part. If we're putting this dihybrid cross together, what ends up happening is that the dominant trait is going to show itself most often, right? So we end up having nine of these squares out of the 16 possible that end up being round yellow seats. If we have a dominant and a recessive put together and that yields a dominant as far as the rounding is concerned and a recessive as far as the coloration is concerned, that will yield a green circle. So we'll have a round seed, but it will end up being green. We'll see this is the second most common. Also, if we are going to have a recessive and a dominant combination where we flip that, where the round gene is going to end up being recessive and the yellow gene ends up being dominant, then we will see what ends up being a round yellow, right? Or, or a, uh, sorry, a wrinkled yellow, which will be the same level of occurrence as the ring as the round green. Finally, if we get a set of both where the rounded genome and the coloration genome are both recessive and we get all recessive across the board, then we will end up being wrinkled and green in coloration. And we'll see that that's a one out of 16 chance. So that's a one sixteenth chance out of a dihybrid cross that that generation actually becomes double recessive. So next is Mendel's law of independent assortment. So homologous chromosomes are going to be paired randomly. So we see that the exact allele combination in a gamete depends on which chromosomes happen to be packaged together. So an individual genotype is therefore able to produce approximately equal numbers of four types of gametes. Next is the product rule. The product rule is basically the chance that the parents are uh, heterozygous for three genes give rise to the same offspring, right? So if we have, let's say, rounded coloration, or sorry, uh, rounded shape uh, coloration, and then a T gene, okay, we're going to have three separate genes put together, and we're going to have a chance of variability of that. So if we have heterozygous genes put together for all three, that means that we're going to end up with a one eighth chance that the offspring is heterozygous for all three of these as well. 
So we have to multiply the probabilities by uh, for each one of these individuals by the same or by three. Now this is looking at linked genes. So what linked genes are, right, showing that gene types are going to stick together in a lot of different cases. Okay, so the Punnett square here is going to show if genes A and B are on separate chromosomes. However, uh, the actual genotype ratio is going to be skewed toward two of the four offspring classes. So we reveal the genes A and B, in this particular case, do not assort independently, so they are linked, right? What that means is that when we put these together, right, we have the gray or black color, we have the normal or vestigial wings. When we put them together, we yield approximately the equal numbers of offspring, but the genotypic ratio is skewed, okay? So that means the genotypic ratio is going to show us that we're actually getting a one to one to one to one ratio instead of a one to two or a one to three type of ratio. So we actually see these differentiations are going to end up being all across the board the same. All right, crossing over. And this is uh, reminiscent of what we talked about with the meiosis lecture. This is where our gene alleles are going to recombine and form new allele segments on the opposite chromosome. So two parent alleles are coming together and they're going to swap. We see a parental chromatid separated out into a recombinant chromatid. That is going to yield genetic differentiation upon division. And that gives us some gametes that contain recombinant arrangements of alleles, which leads to different genetic profiles and different phenotype. For branching linkages, okay, crossing over is more likely to happen with separate alleles, right? And to separate those alleles, we have to be able to make more room for the exchange to occur. So here, for example, on this fruit fly, we have locations of five genes, right? The numbers are going to represent the frequency of crossover relative to the leftmost gene, which is Y. So for instance, genes that are closer together are going to be much more likely to move across each other. In this genome, we see the genes V and W are very far apart. So the likelihood of them crossing over, all right, Genes W and Y are close together, so crossing over is less likely to separate those alleles. So here we have a glossary of terms talking about genome. Linked genes are genes that carry on the same chromosome. Parental chromatid is carrying the alleles of one parent alone. The recombinant chromatid is a mix of alleles from both parents. And a recombinant offspring is an individual that inherits a recombinant chromatid. So here's looking at a subset of the population which could potentially see incomplete dominance. We see this a lot with plants where we have things like pollen transfer that could be incomplete, or you might get different pollens that are mixed in together on the same plant, producing a little bit of a weird hybrid type of thing. So incomplete dominance happens, right? For example, here, this is a plant known as a snapdragon. This is a cross between plants with red and white flowers. It produces a couple of heterozygous plants that end up with pink flowers, and the red and white phenotypes are going to reappear in the F2 generation. So here we have initial pollinization, all right, red and a white flower. This is going to be between two gametes. Right? We have a completely uh, red one here. We have a completely white one here. We're going to cross them together, and if they are true, they're going to produce pink flowers for the genetic offspring, right? Now, if we take that F1 generation of pink flowers and we combine them together to form an F2 generation, what ends up happening is that we're going to resurface the red and white colors. So we're going to end up with possibility of two heterozygous pink but then our new homozygous dominant recessive will come out again. So that second generation afterwards could potentially yield another white or another red flower. 
right? We're going to see this in a human concept when we talk about like something like red blood cells, right? And antigen exposure. So co-dominance here, our IA and IB alleles of the I gene are going to be co-dominant. So both are fully expressed. The allele for a lowercase i here is going to be recessive. So if the genotype is IA, 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 then we're only going to see type A antigen present. Right? If we see IB, 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 only B. Okay. If we see IA and IB, both of them are dominant. So we're both A and B, which means we have type AB blood. Right? If we have lowercase i, if the allele only i is present, then we don't have a dominant allele there. What that means is that we don't have expression of either A or I. So that leads us to type O, where we don't have any antigens at all. All right, looking at pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is genetic differentiation. This is another example here of a genetic disorder, or genetic uh, syndrome. This is Marfan's, where a single mutated gene is going to cause defective connective tissue. This results in uh, widespread issues, okay? The mutation is going to affect development of the eyes, bones, joints, hearts, heart and lungs. For the eyes, we could potentially get lens dislocation and cataracts. For the bones, we can get excessive length of growth of bones in the arms, hands, legs, and toes. You can see a potential sunken, uh, sunken chest appearance. The heart and lungs, we can get a stretched or weakened aorta because of the decreased connective tissue, heart valve problems, and potential lung collapse. So genotype to phenotype, we have complete dominance. That one allele masks the expression of another. And complete dominance, where two alleles confer an intermediate phenotype. Co-dominance, where two alleles are both fully expressed. Or pleiotropy, where one gene affects multiple seemingly unrelated phenotypes. All right, inheritance of sex. Here uh, we see combination of the female gametes or the eggs, oocytes, combining with our male gametes, which are the sperm. Humans, each of our eggs contains 23 chromosomes with a single X sex chromosome. Sperm is going to contain 23 and includes either an X or a Y. If the Y bearing sperm cell fertilizes the egg, the baby will be male. If the X bearing sperm fertilizes the egg, the baby will be female. So here are a selection of disorders as far as genetics are concerned. X-linked recessive are going to be things like muscular dystrophy, fragile X syndrome, hemophilia A, red-green colorblindness, and Rett syndrome. X-linked dominant inheritance. These are going to be things like extra hairiness, right? This is also hypertrichosis. We can have hypophosphatemic rickets, which means that we have very low phosphate or phosphorus absorption leading to defective bones. Retinitis pigmentosa, which is going to affect the retina and the eye, causing partial blindness. All right, so when we look at something like hemophilia, which is affecting the blood, inheritance of hemophilia and a cross between a heterozygous female and a healthy male, right, the chance of having son with hemophilia is going to be 25%. So here we see a healthy gamete mother, this is heterozygous, versus a male. If it is an X-linked disease, which it is, then we will potentially have healthy daughter, which is a carrier or a healthy daughter with a homozygous dominant allele. Since our son is going to have a Y chromosome present, it is going to be at the mercy of whether that uh, chromosome that we accepted from the female has a dominant or recessive trait. So if it is a male, and it's born with a copy of the female gamete that has a recessive uh, allele on it, then we will end up with expression of hemophilia. All right, so here's an example of X inactivation. For example, this is in cats. We see X chromosomes carry a coat color, right? And the coat color gene is either for black or orange. And a calico cat, that is someone who's going to, or, uh, that is a feline that is going to be heterozygous for the gene. So one of the two X chromosomes is inactivated.
Here's a couple other genetic disorders for autosomal dominant inheritance. We have achondroplasia, all right? We have familial uh, hypercholesterolemia, Huntington's disease and Marfan syndrome. Achondroplasia is where we have an issue with conversion of cartilage to bone, so that ends up in dwarfism. Hypercholesterolemia is high cholesterol, which can result in heart disease. Huntington's is going to be a very difficult one to treat. This is progressive, uncontrollable movements and personality changes uh, in middle age. It's going to affect proteins in the brain, all right, and cause clumps and misfoldings and brain cells that are going to be very detrimental to health and overall function. Autosomal recessive inheritance, something like albinism, where we lack pigmentation. Cystic fibrosis, which is going to be a mutant allele on the chloride channel protein causing lung infections and congestion. Phenylketonuria, which we talked about a little bit earlier, mutant allele on the 12th chromosome causing enzyme deficiency. So we can get intellectual disability because of buildup of byproducts of metabolism and Tay-Sachs disease, which is 15th chromosome mutant allele. We see nervous system uh, degeneration caused by toxic buildup of uh, metabolites. All right, looking at a pedigree, a pedigree is going to look at autosomal dominant traits. So this is looking at different trait offsets. Pedigree for an autosomal recessive trait, affected individuals are going to be homozygous recessive, right? Pedigree for an X-linked recessive trait, Males are affected if they inherit the allele. So models of inheritance, we have autosomal dominant traits. Right? These are conditions where the dominant allele on the non-sex chromosome is going to be expressed. Autosomal recessive traits are going to be a condition where we uh, have a recessive allele on a non-sex chromosome that is expressed. X-linked is going to be caused by the allele on the X chromosome. And a pedigree is a chart used to determine a disorder's mode of inheritance. All right, looking at temperature and fur color, Siamese cats, which uh, my mother has a Siamese cat named Leo, very temperamental cat. Siamese cats have a mutation in the gene that is going to encode for enzymes required for pigmentation. So enzyme is active only at the relatively cool temperatures of the paws ears, snout, and tail. So these are going to be, have darkly pigmented skin tones. <clears throat> At higher temperatures, enzyme is inactive. So areas like thorax, middle of the body, the pigment production is reduced and the skin is going to be lighter. And here's a look at very end, uh, variation in human skin color. All right, we have multiple genes that are going to be encoding for this. And they interact to form the quantity of pigment in skin cells. So this is basically uh, encoding for the m amount of melanin that your melanocytes are going to produce over time. So we can see that the children in the photo here are not from the same family, but they represent a sample of the variation in human skin color across ethnicities. So we're going to have two father, or, sorry, two parents, father and mother. We have three separate genes which are going to encode for this. So each one of them is going to be dominant or recessive and our potential uh, variation or probability of each phenotype in the offspring is going to end up being very, very little or a very small chance, right? So down all the way to one out of 64, as far as this last one is concerned. Okay, another concept is recessive resistance. This is when a heterozygous susceptible insect is bred with a resistant male or a resistant mate. In the test with botulinum toxin here, half of the larvae thrived in the presence of botulinum toxin while the susceptible ones died or were very small. So in this case, we have a resistant mate with a susceptible non-mate, right? So we have the potential for half of them to be resistant, half of them remain heterozygous and remain susceptible. So half of them, right, are going to end up dying. A portion of them are going to end up with low weight. And then the resistant ones are going to end up being normal. All right. That was inheritance and heritability. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Also, our patreon.com slash twisted science. 
is going to be our Patreon. Get exclusive content there. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you at our next video. Peace out.